Welcome back, time for another question show, your questions, my answers. Any week, wherever you are, just put a question on any one of my episodes, I'll find them and I'll answer them here. All right, let's get started. Peter Soja, so how much fantasy science would we actually need to create a galaxy in such a way that it would never die? Just trap all the matter in this bubble and sustain it, far beyond the point where the rest of the universe would be cold and dark. Unfortunately, you would have to break the laws of physics to create a bubble that could never die. The whole concept of entropy is that entropy is always increasing. The amount of, of usable work that you're going to be able to do from the matter and, and energy that's there will always be decreasing. And, and eventually, all of the usable energy would run out and everything would be the same temperature and it would be cold and dead. That said, some future civilization could probably use the resources of their Hubble volume more efficiently than the universe would do it on its own. Think about like a massive, massive star that is, say, 10 times the mass of the sun. It only lives for a couple of million years and explodes as a supernova, uses up all its fuel. That's not very efficient. You could take that massive star, turn it into like 50 red dwarfs, they would live for trillions, 10 trillion years, you know, a quadrillion years. That would be a much more efficient way, long lasting way. So I think for us to try and like live forever, that's not going to be possible, but definitely we can be more energy efficient and live for much, much longer than the universe would do on its own. Richard Schaefer, could a new Big Bang go off somewhere in our existing universe? We don't know what caused the Big Bang in the first place. And one of the ideas is that a Big Bang went off in an existing universe, and so that could be what happens, that you have a universe, and then there's a Big Bang, and then another universe pops into it. Uh, so we don't know. But that said, under quantum theory, one of the things that's kind of interesting is that over vast periods of time, you can that all the position of all the matter in this universe is sort of due to probability. And, you know, the fact that, that, you know, this air happens to be around me is a probability function. This air could actually be in, a, in Andromeda if the math worked out a different way. It's most likely going to be right here, but it could be in Andromeda. And so there's this really great idea, Sean Carroll has done a lot of the research in this, that he's done the math, that if you know, some point down in the far, far future, you could run the numbers enough times that all of the matter in the universe could reconfigure itself into a singularity and could form another Big Bang. And you just would have to wait, like literally, not forever, but, but just this short of forever. It's an incomprehensible amount of time. Like it makes the age of the universe a, a, an incomprehensible fraction of the length of time that you would have to wait. You'd have to wait forever. What I'm saying is you'd have to wait a long time, forever. But, but it could be that the universe will reconfigure itself through just probability and create another Big Bang. And maybe that's what happens. You get a universe, it expands outward, and then it reconfigures itself and you get a new Big Bang and then it goes on and on and on like that. Mike Miller. Since the position and size are both relative to other objects, say a lit light bulb were the only matter in the universe, would you be able to see that light from light years away? No, you, you wouldn't be able to see the light. I mean, I can see what you're thinking. You're thinking like if there's, just, there's nothing in the universe, just one light bulb, it would be the only thing to see. And so if everything else was dark, you'd see that one light bulb. But the, but the problem is, is that really, a light bulb is letting off photons, letting off a certain amount of photons per second, and those photons are streaming off into the universe, and over time, the farther they go, the more those photons get, get distributed over that vast volume of, of space. And so the amount of individual photons that you would receive would be a fraction of a fraction of a fraction. You definitely couldn't see it with your eyes, and in fact, you would go a long, long time without a single photon coming anywhere near you because the volume of space that it's trying to illuminate is so massive. If you were close, you'd see it. So really, it wouldn't, you know, a single light bulb wouldn't look any different than what it does with our bright universe today. Graham Haddon. Will our solar system be thrown out when Andromeda and Milky Way collide? Maybe. We've talked about this, that when, when, 
Andromeda and Milky Way combine when they collide together in, I don't know, was it six billion years, four billion years, that the chances of the stars actually colliding is very low, right? The stars are going to be like, they're, they're super far apart and they're just going to zip past each other for m the vast majority of the interactions. But star systems will absolutely get kicked out of the galaxies. They'll be thrown off into escape velocity uh, trajectories and they'll be gone forever. Will that happen to our sun? Most likely not. The vast majority of the galaxies are all going to get pulled together. The, the vast majority of the systems are going to get pulled together as part of this new larger galaxy. But some pieces will get thrown out into space and maybe the solar system will be one of them. Matt Pilber. Let's say we build a warp drive. What would happen if the spaceship at warp speed collides with a planet, star, or black hole? We don't know if a warp drive is even possible, right? Like it could be that, the, that there is no way to make the physics work for us to be in a spaceship and have it go faster than the speed of light. Maybe you, you could do it by using up all the energy in the universe, which isn't really feasible. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, is that we don't know what a warp bubble would do to the space around it. Now, when you think about how a warp drive works, right, is that the ship doesn't move because you can't move through space faster than the speed of light. The ship has to literally remain in its same spot. And then what it does is it warps space. And space can be warped faster than the speed of light. And so you would sort of uh, pull space from in front of you and put it behind you, and that would make it feel like you were moving through space, but the reality is, is that really you're just bending space. So the question is, what would happen to planets, stars, things like that, as you pulled them through you? And, and we, just, we just don't know. We don't know if it's feasible. We don't know what the actual physics will require, if it's even possible. So right now, unfortunately, the answer is we don't know. Maybe you would still somehow be connected to the universe, and as you try to pull yourself through a planet or pull yourself through a star, or I guess pull the star past you, uh, you would interact with a star and it would, you know, you'd still feel the heat and it would kill you. Or maybe you would be able to just pull space and reposition space behind you. So there was a star in front of you, now the star's behind you, and you didn't have to interact with any of the in-between space. Realities we just don't know. We don't even know if it's possible. VDT. Hey Fraser, I love your videos. I have one question about ISS. Why do they choose to keep ISS at the height of 400 kilometers? Wouldn't it be much more fuel efficient and less risky if they orbit at a higher altitude? One problem I can think of is require more fuel to send astronauts to that height, but it should be less than lifting the entire space station. There must be some other reason too, isn't it? You hit the nail on the head, which is that there is this sort of sweet spot, right? Getting astronauts up into orbit to an altitude of, what, 350 nautical miles? I forget the exact height, is sort of the most fuel efficient thing that you're going to want to do. You can send up massive cargo. Like that's the hard part is getting all of that cargo, getting that rocket up into that point. To boost the International Space Station every couple of months a few more kilometers higher again is not a gigantic use of fuel and it's a lot more useful to have the space station where it is closest to Earth, sort of within the Earth's protective magnetosphere, close, so the amount of energy that you require to get up to it is as low as possible, uh, close enough that it can view the Earth. So really NASA did the math and this was the sweet spot, the best place to, to put the International Space Station. Tommy K. Hey Fraser, I'm in a high school and I'm interested in pursuing a degree in astronomy and astrophysics. However, I've heard it's a very narrow field. Is it worth it? Now, I'm not an astronomer. <laughs> I am a journalist. Uh, but I know a ton of them. And yes, it is hard to get into the field. There's not a lot of positions that open up from the observatories, from the universities, for various research institutions. A lot of astronomers are competing for very few jobs. But if it's your passion, you got to do what you what you got to do, right? And so I think that if you love astronomy and you think that you want to make that your career, then go for it. Go to university, take sci, you know, astronomy and physics, uh, get your master's degree, get your PhD, and and follow that path. And if you're good enough, you'll be able to get a position and be a working astronomer.
but I recommend a backup plan. And the backup plan that I recommend is computers, right? If you are good with computers and you enjoy working with them, make that your backup plan. Take computer science at the same time. There's a million jobs as a computer scientist. And in fact, astronomy now really is computer science. Like a lot of what astronomers do is they're working with computers. They're running scripts to go through gigantic databases and search for asteroids and things like that. It's the sort of, it's the good backup plan. And so that way you, you try to become an astronomer who is really good at computer science, which is very important for being an astronomer, and at the same time if that doesn't work, then you're a computer scientist, or you work for a software company, or you work for Google, and so there's lots of jobs there. So that's what I would recommend. Cool Chucho. Fraser, if our sun is bright, would we see the colors that we see with our eyes on a brighter star, like a blue star, if we were near a star that big on a habitable planet? So the question is, like, if we were, had a blue, hot star in the sky, would we see different colors that we don't see? No, right? The electromagnetic spectrum is the electromagnetic spectrum. And so the, really all you know, radio waves, microwaves, and infrared radiation, visible light, gamma rays, x-rays, they are all just a different frequency of of electromagnetic radiation. The fact that we see the colors, we see the green around me and the blue on my shirt, these are specific wavelengths of light that are bouncing into the photoreceptors in our eyes and our brain is seeing that as the color blue or the color green. And so if we were transported with our, with our, the way we are physically to one of those habitable planets around a, a blue star, we would see still the same colors. Things would be bluer, but we would still see blue and green. We wouldn't see colors that we can't even comprehend. Now, when you think about things like a mantis shrimp, they see colors that we don't see, but partly it's because their brains are sort of allowing, are, are sort of seeing different segments of the electromagnetic radiation spectrum and calling those colors. You know, if our eyes if our brains work that way, we might be able to do this, the same thing as well. So no, there, the electromagnetic spectrum is just what it is. And wherever you went around the universe, you would still just see the same kinds of colors that, that we see here on Earth, just more red or more blue. Stephen Doom. Fraser, do you think millions of years from now another civilization will pick up a signal from radio waves that were created by humans? We did an episode about this called Are Aliens Watching Our Old TV Shows? And so, yes, we are have been sending out signals into space for maybe 50, 75 years now, and so there's a sphere around the Earth that our signals have gone, and over millions of years, those signals will go millions of light years, and so, it, you know, say in 100 and... 50,000 years, our signals have, will have encapsulated the entire Milky Way. But the reality is, is that the strength of our signals is super weak, and o over distance, the amount of that signal that you can receive is incredibly small. And so, uh, an alien civilization would have an impossible time detecting our signals at, at any distance. Unless we're firing a beam directly at another star, they're not going to detect our signals. And so, I, practically, no. Theoretically, yes. Lack of Kiros. What are the main engineering challenges of a spacecraft able to travel at a significant fraction of the speed of light, something like 0.2c? Well, the biggest engineering challenge is building a engine capable of getting a spaceship to 0.2c, right? What are your options? You need something that, can, that, can, that has a specific impulse, that can kick matter out the back fast enough to get you to that point to see. And really the only ideas that we have right now are lasers, that you shoot a laser at a solar sail and theoretically that would accelerate a spaceship up to a significant portion of the speed of light. Once you could do that, or maybe, you know, maybe an antimatter drive could do it or a, a fusion drive, we, you know, we, there could be other engineering advances. Once you did that, then the real problem is you're now going 20% the speed of light through the universe. And so bits of dust and rocks and meteorites and, and particles are going to be hitting your spacecraft at 20% the speed of light, which, you know, even a piece of sand hitting a spaceship at that speed would tear a hole right through it. So it's a sort of, that is the greatest engineering challenge is, is to just keep your ship in one piece as you're going that speed. And then of course, just to get to the nearest 
star system, which is four light years away, it would take you 20 years to get there. And so you need to have a spaceship that could repair itself over the course of that 20 year lifespan. And that's just the closest star. The really interesting stars are going to be dozens, hundreds of light years away. So you gotta keep your spacecraft in repair for 100 years, for 500 years, for 1,000 years. That's an enormous engineering challenge. So I would say just getting thrust that powerful, dealing with the debris that you're gonna be hitting, and then keeping the whole thing in maintenance over that vast period of time. Vahuk Lam, quick question. Not sure why anyone wants to, but what might be the most effective way to destroy a galaxy? Building von Neumann machines to slowly push everything into the center black hole? Are you some kind of super villain? If I tell you how to do this, do you promise not to actually do it? Because the Milky Way is where I keep all my stuff. All right, here's what you do. You build a Shkadov thruster, which is a gigantic mirror on one side of the sun. And then what happens is the sun's gravity pulls itself towards the mirror but the mirror reflects the sunlight off of it and gets pushed away from the sun. And what this does is this makes the mirror drag the sun around wherever you want it to go in the Milky Way. It takes a long time, take you a couple of billion years, but if you had enough time, you could steer every single star in the Milky Way into the supermassive black hole at the heart of the Milky Way. Now, you would create a quasar while the stars are being fed into the black hole, but if you're patient, and you, if you're a supervillain like that, you probably are, you could just gather them all up, feed them all into the black hole, and just kill the entire galaxy. And you would end up with a black hole with 200 billion times the mass of the sun. Congratulations, you monster. Rizki RF Windyarto. Hey Fraser, is it possible to use a laser propulsion to keep satellites in its orbit? For our current satellites, no, because they're not equipped to receive a later a laser propulsion pulse, right? Uh, however, one really interesting thing is that actually satellites can use just the light coming from the sun to change their direction that they're facing because the light bounces off the satellite and it you know, imparts a little bit of momentum and it changes the position, the direction of the satellite. And over vast periods of time, just regular satellites could get pushed into different orbits because of the light coming from the sun. Now, if we had a satellite that was going around the earth and it was a solar sail and it had this great big sail that was, you know, over top, you know, configured around it and you had some kind of laser system on the ground and as the solar sail passed by you went bzzz, and zapped it with your laser and imparted a thrust to it absolutely you could just keep zapping these satellites and keep them from say re-entering the earth's atmosphere or even changing their uh you know their altitude from the earth at the same time the sun is letting out a tremendous amount of photons and so you could use just the sun's photons to raise and lower and move your solar sail anywhere you wanted within kind of the inner solar system. So lasers will do the trick, the sun will do the trick. I really want us to have more solar sails. I think it's an amazing idea, it's an amazing technology. I really wish we were further along on that technology curve. All right, thanks again for everyone who sent in their questions. I really appreciate it, that was super fun. As always, if you're on any video on my channel, just Type in your question and I will find it and I will pick a bunch of my favorites and I'll answer them here. The other thing that I've done for this episode, I've created a custom playlist of some new, really cool space science videos that are happening on YouTube. So click here, watch them, and, uh, and sort of see what I'm watching. Once again, my feet have gone to sleep.